Good evening. For those of you that are joining us via Zoom, thank you. And we will be starting our presentation shortly. We are also live streaming on Facebook. So those of you that are joining us on Facebook in just a few moments as our Zoom webinar fills with our registered participants, we will be getting this webinar presentation underway. Before we get going on tonight's webinar, I wanna remind everybody that we will be having a presentation that's approximately one hour in length, and we will leave about 30 minutes for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. For those of you that are on Zoom, we will have our chat bar available and you can key in your questions in the chat bar in order for the questions to be facilitated by myself. My name is Leslie Graves and I will be your MC and your Zoom host for this evening. If you are not seeing me on page, but you are seeing Brian much, don't worry, that will work out just fine. As much of the presentation, Brian will be giving that presentation to you. So for those of you that are on Facebook, we do have an administrator on our Facebook Live presentation. And if you key in your questions into the comment area, those questions will be relayed over to our Zoom host. And we will be able to take those questions during the question and answer period for the last 30 minutes of our presentation. So no questions and an answers during the presentation. It'll be about 45 minutes to an hour long, but we will do Q&A afterwards. At this time, I do want to give an introduction to our facilitator. Brian Much lives in Santa Rosa with his wife and two children. He moved out from the Philadelphia area in 2002 to attend graduate school at Santa Rosa State University where he received his master's degree in cultural resources management and continues working today as the coordinator of the Northwest Information Center, one of nine information centers that are part of the California Historical Resources Information System. While exploring the outdoors in Northern California, going to school and developing his roots here in the area, Brian had the privilege of being appointed for eight years to the City of Santa Rosa's Cultural Heritage Board. Currently, he has the honor of serving as the Landmarks Commissioner representing the county's third district and also is the current president of the Board of Directors for the Historical Society of Santa Rosa, who are your hosts for this webinar as well as every other month webinars during the year of 2022. Now, for our presentation, Can You Dig It? A Retrospective of Various Archaeological Efforts Conducted in Santa Rosa. Brian, would you like to take it away? Welcome. Thank you, Leslie. Really appreciate that. Um, and, you know, just before I get started, of course, uh, all the mistakes I make as I talk are mine and mine alone um, and don't represent the viewpoint of any of the affiliations that I might represent at time. So. Just want to make sure folks understand I'm speaking from Brian tonight, uh, little B Brian, uh, as you may, as you may know him. Um, uh, can, can you dig it? Um, this is a title I had a lot of fun goofing around with, and from my mind, um, I'm really looking at it from multiple layers and from different directions. Um, uh, are archaeologists able to dig it? Uh, maybe should you dig it could have been another question I would have asked, or is it diggable, um, if you will, but, but the concept uh, and the play on words is a bit purposeful. Um, it's also on the heels of the fact that this, this was honestly my B-side. Uh, I had originally hoped for Archaeology Month back in October to bring together a panelists of uh, some archaeologists that have really applied their trade in the area, but uh, Murphy's Law being what it was, October, just it, it didn't happen. So I set about uh, working on tonight's presentation. So what are we dealing with tonight? Um, you know, we really are taking a retrospective look back, but I also wanted to provide a bit of an overview, maybe a primer perhaps, to, to highlight some of the trends in archeology span and cultural resource management in and around the Santa Rosa area that have occurred over the last, um, you know, 50, 60 years. Um, 
And, um, you know, with that, we, we do need to have the conversation, of course, archaeology, public disclosure, um, you know, typically, uh, these are things that are a bit, you know, tough to talk about in a public section, uh, sector, if you will. Uh, a lot of this stems from uh, laws that are on the books. Uh, there's California government code sections and public resource code sections that exempt archaeological sites from Public Records Act, uh, requiring records to be open for inspection, uh, public resource code uh, statements that prohibit knowing, will, knowing and willful excavation uh, on public lands. Um, you know, I bring these up because at the majority of the time, uh, we really do need to keep the archaeological locations confidential. Uh, from the general public. Um, and, you know, for me, at least the reasons are clear, given the damage looting uh, can cause an archaeological site, whether it's a pre-contact site, indigenous Native American archaeology, or post-contact. Um, the market for selling artifacts is lucrative. Um, it's, it's real, and it continues today. Um, so what I did was look for locations that perhaps could preclude access due to uh, conditions of today and, and maybe what happened in the archeological um, efforts in the past. Um, so, you know, I, I tried my hardest and I think I found a good group of, uh, of sites that we can talk about. Um, and Cause I think it's important to bring archeological sites where feasible to the public for discussion. Uh, a lot of the work that's done that I'm gonna be highlighting in, in a lot of ways is meant for the public domain. Uh, regrettably, funds aren't available at times to turn the technical detailed reports into readily consumable public information where, where really a lot of it belongs, uh, you know, with important caveats uh, in place. Uh, at times you can have a conversation about the information without discussing the specific location. Um, and here I'm trying to dance around on that, uh, on that fence, if you will. Um, I will say that, um, you know, some of the sites I talk about, you're going to hear things coming up again and again. Uh, historic era disturbances to the landscape um, do cause all sorts of disturbances to all sorts of archaeological deposits. Um, but it's not, it's not universal in, by any means. Um, at times, nature is sneaky and it covers things up. Um, and historic cultural evolution is, is uh, haphazard and it, and it doesn't affect an area. Maybe an archaeological deposit is covered with a thick layer of uh, overburden from a river depositional event or uh, environmental development in a certain area misses a little pocket. Um, and this is where, um, you know, it's the job of the archaeologist to assess where these potential landforms exist, you know, where areas of undisturbed soils may exist. Because this can lead to the location and hopeful, from my perspective, preservation of uh, intact archaeological deposits, whether these are, um, you know, from the last 150 years or so, or going back thousands upon thousands of years. Um, we've got a lot of examples of uh, cultural evolution here in the uh, North Bay that um, span thousands upon thousands of years. Um, before I continue, um, I did want to take a minute to uh, acknowledge. Um, you know, at least uh, long before I uh, uh, arrived on this side of the continent uh, and before Santa Rosa ever thought of being Santa Rosa or Franklin Town, uh, the land around us where many of us are sitting right now was the traditional lands of various indigenous communities, speakers of various languages. Um, it's important that we recognize uh, that we, the newcomers uh, to this land, uh, have benefited and continue to benefit from the use and occupation of this land whether the indigenous communities, past, present, and future, uh, are known to us by their linguistic names, such as Pomo, Coast Miwok, or Wapo. The reality is the same, they're still here today. And these communities have and continue very much still today to steward the land. And it's vitally important that we include not just indigenous viewpoints in our practice as archeologists, but also indigenous communities and the individuals themselves so we can move past mere words and into action where we create uh, an inclusive space for us all uh, to live and recognize past cultures. It's also important from my perspective to recognize that archaeologists study the material remains of past people that, that aren't as well related to the indigenous communities uh, as well. These communities and cultures are also just as vital to connect with and work with uh, as cultural resource managers move uh, projects forward and research is undertaken and evaluations of significance are made. Often historical archaeologists add to our collective story information about ordinary folks and 
the data they add to the mix, often it, it provides a view into these aspects that can contrast or confirm with the historical record. Um, many people talk about the historical record as favoring certain segments of society, um, but your trash, what you throw away, well, it does often speak truths about what you really do on a daily basis. Kind of some of my things. So, you know, as we shift back and kind of take our, our time traveling uh, uh, effort here, um, you know, we start back into our early days of archaeology that occurred around the Santa Rosa past. Uh, and a lot of it boils back down to some work done through the University of California at Berkeley. Um, various folks uh, connected with Berkeley start uh, coming around the North Bay in the Santa Rosa area, making maps, uh, taking a few notes, maybe. Um, it's also important that while there's maybe a couple laws on the books, the Antiquities Act, maybe a couple other legal context, uh, this is nothing like we're going to see as we move into, <clears throat> into the 60s. Um, this is when things really start heating up. This is when my profession's born. Uh, thank you, Richard Nixon uh, and others. Uh, you know, uh, National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 is, you know, is born. There's various executive orders that start modifying uh, and uh, the, the act is, is amended. Um, at the state level, we also here in California get our Envi California Environmental Quality Act and its term historical resources, but they're largely geared at the same kind of concept where we need to start taking into account projects effects on uh, cultural environment as well as the natural environment in the cultural environment. Uh, at times shifted from a very broad sociocultural world, uh, you know, includes architectural resources. And, uh, you know, you get archeological sites coming into the mix and various refinements over time on what needs to be studied, how and when. Um, and it really is, uh, you know, it, it brings us all the way up into these modern times where, you know, we're, we're bless their heart, provided wonderful flow charts on how to get through a process, which at times feels like you're on a, on a wheel just spinning. Um, but we also see uh, techniques change uh, significantly as we get into more modern times. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more of these uh, towards the end to hear a little bit um, where we, you know, we start looking at uh, the concept of remote sensing and other non-invasive means to identify perhaps intact deposits without having to do the destructive act of archaeology. Um, so it's a, it's a really, um, it's a really interesting one. And the laws continue to change too. Um, you know, it, keeping current in the laws is is paramount. There's there's changes to how the process is meant to. Uh, proceed and whom is meant to be contacted. Um, it's a very um, fluid environment and one which uh, is hopefully moving to a more uh, inclusive conversation about what's important and, and how development should proceed, for my opinion, of course. Um, so before we move into that deeper dive of, uh, of the archaeology, I just wanted to kind of highlight at least and provide for everybody a uh, obligatory uh, data table just to make sure uh, everybody understands, you know, uh, it is an archaeological presentation, of course, uh, got to have some data. Um, and to be honest, I, I didn't really go into the trenches to understand uh, um, some of these numbers. It was interesting to me to just run some queries uh, and look at within the Santa Rosa area, generally speaking, the number of reports uh, that were conducted over the decades uh, uh, and how many of these reports included uh, excavation. Now, excavation is a term that likely does mean different things to different people, but at the end of the day, um, looking at the broad trends, uh, you know, there was this huge upkick all of a sudden in the 2010s with number of excavations, and perhaps uh, that's meaningful, perhaps not, but uh, interesting for me to see uh, the explosion of certain work at different times uh, and, and how those, uh, those trends track. Um, but tonight, I really want to key in on um, one specific project uh, in general. And, and tonight's main uh, kind of main effort, if you will, that we're unifying around is uh, a project that got started uh, in at least the report was written in 73. Uh, the urban renewal project uh, comes on the heels of uh, the 1969 earthquake, as well as federal cost chair programs 
to try to seek uh, urban development projects in, in uh, cities and counties all across the, the country. Um, it was quite the rage back then, and Santa Rosa was, uh, was part of it as well. And with these new laws on the books, new efforts had to be undertaken to, uh, to begin an analysis to determine what kind of impact uh, the proposed project might have on archaeological sites. Uh, and this initial effort was led by Melander, Owens, and King, uh, and followed up by work on the relatively new, at the time, California State College, Sonoma, um, which, just for the record, is where I got my master's uh, at Sonoma State University. Um, and, uh, and as we move through, I just wanted to introduce everybody to the project area so we kind of had a sense of what they were looking at as they were, um, as they were studying their, uh, the project, if you will. And the study boundaries starting on the east there, you have E Street. Um, we come down around and have Sonoma Avenue and the creek uh, under channeled. Uh, and then we have the above channel portion of the creek. Over in the west edge, we're kind of bounded by the freeway all the way up at the northwest corner to 7th Street and then back down around kind of on 4th Street through the middle. And so that's the area that we're looking at. And during the first phase of work, the methods were primarily surface survey. Archaeologists walked over areas looking for indications of archaeological sites. Um, primary focus was the identification of Native American sites and various recommendations for standing structures. Not that they weren't looking for intact archaeological deposits from the historic era, but wasn't as much of the focus uh, in reading through the information. Uh, intact deposits were being looked at, looked for, but uh, definitely the focus was for uh, um, term midden comes up in the literature a lot. This is uh, culturally affected soil from habitation over a long period of time. And uh, individual artifacts weren't quite the, uh, the focus uh, by these uh, efforts at the time. It was more looking for uh, large sites, burials, um, and not uh, smaller uh, use sites. Um, one thing that they did note um, is a lot of disturbance in the area, a significant amount of uh, disturbance uh, at the time uh, from likely from the earthquake uh, in 6 and 69, as well as uh, various historic development they tied to pipeline and other infrastructure work. Um, there was some uh, archaeological sites identified within uh, the, the general area. Um, but none of them that were determined to be significant or important. They did note a significant amount of standing structures that they wanted to uh, make sure folks were aware of. Again, you know, here's their map from the report showing some of the existing structures as of 73. Um, you can see at this point in time, the new post office is on its site in the southeast corner of our project area. We have the federal building uh, coming up here soon, the city hall. Uh, the Hoke House is still up there on the north bank of Santa Rosa Creek. You got the PG&E yard kind of coming all the way over to Santa Rosa Avenue now, not as tight as it used to be. Um, you know, some of the buildings that are still standing, you know, we still have the post office annex up at 5th and A Street. Um, we have the old uh, Roxy Theater there at 5th and uh, B Street is still there and the Cal Theater, the Occidental Hotel. Um, all sorts of buildings are still standing that these uh, uh, consultants make comment on. And, you know, they definitely make note of, uh, um, you know, there were no, uh, to their knowledge, uh, and through their efforts, no pre-gold uh, um, uh, pre rush standing buildings in the, uh, in the project area. Uh, very little, uh, even pre-quake. Uh, buildings by the time they were said and done. There was only a few, Hoke House being one of them. Um, but it was, uh, you know, a lot of stuff from after the 06 earthquake and, and on up and through. Um, so Santa Rosa's building stock showing its, uh, its decline. And they pointed out these buildings as being significant, certain buildings as being significant and, and warranting further uh, preservation and, and, and made the case for further preservation. A lot of it was... Uh, determined to not be viable for a variety of purposes. Um, and, and as we get in, you'll, you know, as many of you know, kind of what came in that area west of B Street, um, you know, we'll, we'll get to see. And, and one of the first areas that came out of that work that, that we're going to go into and look at is uh, when I started clearing the work, 
um, at the old Roxy Theater. Um, and so as we move through these next slides, just to orient everybody, you're going to see a modern, air, modern aerial in the lower right-hand corner, and you're going to see a, a Thomas Brothers map or a USGS map uh, in the kind of upper left. Um, in the modern aerial, you'll see that the mall's there, um, and, that's, and that's a lot of what took up this space, whether it's the mall physical or the parking garage structures for it. Um, that is our, uh, our legacy, if you will, for, for what replaced a lot of these buildings. Um, and, and we will. We'll begin with the uh, Roxy Theater and Post Office Annex. And, and observation methods here started in 77. Uh, uh, um, they came out there and did their observations. Um, and a lot of the work had already been done. Um, the seating area had already been demolished and uh, still soil was being overlaid on top of it. Um, there was some arche ar uh, archaeological uh, material found in uh, disturbed contexts. And this is, again, uh, something that we're going to hear a lot of these disturbed contexts. Um, you know, they did talk about the fill being added to the Roxy Theater area to help protect and preserve any archaeological resources that may be present below it. Um, and that's also a, um, maybe a belief in a lot of cases that this fill layer could protect anything below. Um, what that does to us 50 years later, perhaps, is make us have to consider when the later development comes into some of these locations, perhaps that fill layer placed in the 70s and 80s is something that is capping a deposit below it. Um, the post office annex uh, um, was uh, already in its process as well and the construction for uh, um, th its replacement we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, where the post office moves um, is its own little fun story that we'll get to. Um, the next little spot I want to highlight is our Third Street underpass. Everybody who's uh, um, gone from east to west in the city, at least I have always uh, enjoyed that ride underneath the mall. Um, and for me, at least, I'm always wondering, you know, gosh, what, what came out? What came out of the ground here? This seems like a neat little area, um, kind of not too far from the creek. Uh, here we are in the middle of the city. And, and it's true, this is one of the areas that yielded um, probably some of the most archeological materials from some of the monitoring that was conducted in the 70s. Um, at the end of the day, no uh, discrete sites were identified, just a lot of archeological material. One of the most interesting things I found from this work was uh, um, on the north bank of Third Street, uh, we'll see in, um, we have some uh, artifacts that we can, we can show in some, in some drawings too, uh, the, some of the artifacts that were found through this area. Um, and so these are some of the few uh, drawings that uh, were provided for some of the materials that were uh, observed um, during this work. Um, also, what was, uh, to me, one of the more interesting uh, observations was on the north bank of 3rd Street. It's kind of tough to tell from the image, but there's a cluster of dots, for lack of a better term, over on the 3rd uh, Street end. And on the north side of the 3rd Street blank, um, an old redwood sewer pipe with uh, red brick was located. And the redwood plank overlaid four different channels of redwood pipes all grouped together. Uh, each section of the pipe had ma male and female ends with a hole 10 centimeters in diameter uh, <clears throat> within a 12 centimeter square. Um, and, you know, these are likely uh, probably dating from some of the original work. Um, these archaeologists theorized from the 1850s. I don't have any, uh, you know, reason to, to, to doubt that, but some, some really old uh, infrastructure of Santa Rosa, which... Uh, may not be the most uh, maybe interesting thing that folks think about, but redwood pipes and uh, uh, water distribution, waste distribution systems, totally fascinating from my side of town. Um, but also uh, we have a, a, a huge ash pit with lots of uh, ceramic fragments and old glass. Um, we do have along the south side of uh, Third Street, uh, there underneath the mall um, is where a number of these uh, Flake stone artifacts came from uh, knives and some spears. Um, and they did describe the soils as the cuts were being made uh, through down. And, and they, they seem to have gotten to the water table uh, and noted a significant amount of disturbance within that uh, stratum on the way down. 
Um, and by and large, the lack of midden and, and shell area led them to believe that no archaeological sites were represented in the area um, and, and other area cleared for development. As we move to our next spot, we're going to head up the street here and go to uh, the Occidental Hotel. California Theater. Now, some of the Occidental Hotel uh, is one of those uh, locations that um, does conjure some really interesting uh, um, stories. Uh, you know, we had our 1861 dime come from here. Um, so as the workers were pulling the floorboards in the, in the hotel, one of the workers found and gave to the monitors an 1861 dime. Um, everybody likes finding something nice and dateable like that. Um, you know, kind of neat. One of the other kind of finds here that was of interest uh, to folks was a 1905 cracked 1905 marble headstone of Nora Peterson found beneath the Fifth Street entrance. Um, and it was in a fill layer deposited prior to the 1908 reconstruction of the hotel that had occurred. Um, and so um, just all sorts of things that you can find for sure. Uh, we also had um, some other historic era refuse found in and around, whether they were deposits from prior uh, occupants in the area, um, depositional events really didn't, wasn't discussed much. Um, the, the historic era research that went into some of the observations was a little lacking, but generally speaking, um, just some brief observations. Um, again, the, the main conclusion that the archaeologists found here was that while they found um, some minor uh, artifacts here and there, an obsidian flake or two, there was no intact sites to be found and uh, everything could, could proceed uh, as such. Um, some of the best uh, stratigraphy was found over near the California Theater. Um, and this, this was really interesting because it did find an old creek bed where they, they theorized they found an old creek bed. Relic creek beds uh, are something that archaeologists have a lot of fun chasing out. Um, you know, our creeks have meandered across uh, the Santa Rosa Plain over time. And old creek channels are often um, great areas to be near. Uh, when the water used to flow there. And over thousands of years, the creek moves its channels. Um, so where the Santa Rosa Creek now is, folks need to remember, is not probably where it was, say, 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. And so this old creek bed that was observed may be uh, a, a tidbit of information that it helps reconstruct that environment, um, there go allowing for maybe the identification of an um, intact surface that relates to that creek bed. Um, and, you know, it, it's another instance of uh, a lot of material came up out of the ground in places, but no discrete archaeological sites were found. There was a lot of material mixed in with other material, uh, a lot of Native American or indigenous materials mixed in with historic material, a lot of disturbance discussed. Um, and uh, again, it seems to be uh, kind of par for the course within this area. Um, again, probably hearkening back to the 1906 earthquake in a lot of cases. After they uh, worked on the uh, Cal Theater and Occidental Hotel, some of the next projects went over in some of the uh, street work that had to go on to set the stage on First and B Street. Um, and in this area, again, uh, there was, uh, the classic careful study of the soils, um, where they could get after the intact soils. They were looking for cuts. Uh, a lot of this was done via spot checking, not in identification of intact areas ahead of time. Um, you know, if a concrete sewer pipe had to come out, the archaeologists would be allowed into the hole to take a look afterwards to see what was there. Um, and that's where we get a lot of con uh, conversation and notes about the, um, the disturbances that are, that are in there. A lot of it go with the uh, um, pipe and other ancillary uh, maintenance that had been done for, for different construction projects as the roadway was, was worked up. Um, we did find a few, uh, uh, again, uh, 
isolated artifacts, a uh, uh, obsidian, not obsidian, I apologize, a uh, um, abalone button uh, was found um, on north side of uh, uh, First Street over near where the parking lots are at nowadays. I guess there was an old Oldsmobile dealership back in that day up there. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, historic era refuse um, concentrated in a couple places, but not so much that warranted uh, designation of a site per se, as a lot of it was found to be pushed and deposited as fill. So a lot of the challenges that, that they were facing was that, um, that aspect. One of the really interesting features as well, similar to our uh, Redwood um, sewer pipes was found uh, just east of where the Hoke house had been was a brick and wood feature that had uh, some, some pretty good age to it was surmised. And again, going back into the 1860s, 70s, uh, the archeologists thought um, a building that was no longer there at the time, obviously, but one that um, did leave uh, some impressions on the archeologists. As we move over to our next uh, little case study, we're gonna move up the, up the street some to uh, the Wood Engine Works building and the Scottish Rights building and parking lots. So in uh, October, November of 78, uh, observations were made of trenching activities as well as uh, um, the demolition of the, of the buildings. Um, in addition, there was a, a walnut orchard that was uh, being looked at as a bunch of obsidian material had been found there. Uh, they did some trenching with backhoes, similar situation. The obsidian ended up being recovered within um, soil that was believed to be uh, um, disturbed from uh, clearing of the construction of the temple building site. Um, again, no natural soil surfaces could be distinguished and uh, the obsidian was determined to be the part of that disturbed strata. Uh, they tried to place some auger borings in, got down to about a meter and uh, kind of gave up. And that depth was pretty typical. Folks didn't tend to go down too, too deep back in the 70s, it seems, at least in these areas. And as we move to our... Uh, our next one, this is where we start to get into, uh, um, you know, maybe a little bit more of a, um, a story, perhaps. Uh, it's uh, time to get ready for the new uh, post office location. Um, and in that, uh, in that work in 79, uh, archaeologists got brought in um, as uh, an area was determined to be a well was located. Um, archaeologists uh, dug the well, uh, and they found that the well uh, contained uh, three layers. Um, and, and when archaeologists, yeah, at times they dig uh, archaeological deposits by uh, arbitrary levels, uh, maybe, uh, you know, five centimeters at a time, 10 centimeters at a time, a couple inches at a time. Other times they dig what is called stratigraphically. And, and that's how this uh, feature was dug. It was dug stratigraphically. Um, and the, the main layer that contained the materials of the well that had been filled in over time um, was found to be disturbed. It appeared that it had been dug out and then put back in. So the information that came out of it was um, maybe a little diminished, we could say. Um, because when we lose that uh, integrity of that soil strata, we begin to not have as much we can say as archaeologists about it. That being said, we have uh, a really great example here of what happens when we do start wetting deep historical research with the archaeological record. And what we came to find out is that in the 1860s, after Civil War, uh, the Menifees uh, move out to Santa Rosa. And the Menifees, uh, like a lot of folks, moved to California, it seems, after the Civil War for a variety of reasons. Um, now, their finances weren't such that they could continue their farming lifestyle, per se, um, and were provided through family means a gift of a house in Santa Rosa. And 
And by the 1870 records, looking in census, we start seeing that Mr. Menifee adapted uh, a life as a paper hanger. And although California was running through its depression in the 1870s, uh, Santa Rosa was a growing town. And, uh, you know, as the railroad comes in and, and the population starts increasing, this house construction boom plays well with Mr. Menifee's employment. Um, and he, he later gets described as a, a jobber, I love that term, or basically a, a self-contractor. Um, and this independent occupation probably gives him um, some independence that may carry over well to his past farming lifestyle. Um, that, that sense of independence would probably be welcomed in. Um, and when we go in and we look at the archeological record and the archival record, we see that the Minifees were a lower middle-class family looking at their tax assessment records and, and their status as homeowners. Um, and they also sent their children to school. Um, so, and for longer than was required. Um, and it's also reflected in how they, um, you know, they purchased food. Uh, archeologists will look at cuts of meat and try to determine um, how that plays out in terms of food choices. Um, the food that the Menifees were looking for would likely have sought to feed a family, a soup stock, rather than steaks or chops. Um, the Menifees also uh, used a higher percentage of pork, uh, as well as pig's feet and pig's tongue, which would have been extracted often at home, uh, moreover underlying their ties to their, their origin in the South. Um, typically, uh, we see a predominance of beef uh, in a lot of cases in other lamb, uh, a sheep. Um, but this proportion, uh, nearly 50% of uh, pig in their, in their material, shows a really high uh, proportion, one that uh, really does kind of perhaps harken back to uh, their roots. Um, and, you know, the, the ceramics that are provided are often um, reflected at here in this collection, um, more frugal choices. Um, they're uh, plain wares representing more, more cost-effective or cheap types. Um, there's copycats of more expensive ones present. Um, it's that um, uh, at least classic um, perspective that you know, I personally can relate to the keeping up with the Joneses perhaps, um, you know, it's, it's they're doing what they can to, to keep up in their society, but at the same place uh, needing to make the choices to fit within their economic reality. Um, a really interesting context as we, we got to have uh, some of the early cases of uh, some archeological work uh, done on some of these historic era sites. Moving on from, uh, from that one, um, we move down to uh, perhaps uh, everybody's, at least what I came to know when I moved to Santa Rosa, almost everybody's favorite building that's not there anymore, uh, the Hoke House. Um, and uh, in 1984, uh, the Hoke House was slated for uh, still at its original location. It was getting ready to be moved, um, but uh, through largely through uh, the advocacy of Dan Peterson, uh, archaeologists were able to excavate a trash-filled pit beneath this, the feature. And uh, I'm going to end up uh, reading some sections that come from a. Uh, article that was included in the 1985 issue of the Sonoma County Historical Society Journal. Um, uh, I'll remark again later, and I appreciate uh, the, the prose of uh, the Pretzelises, Adrian and Mary, um, their writing style and is amazing. Um, in 1984, when the Hogue House was still up at its still at its original location, up in piers and ready to be moved at the request of architect Dan Peterson, Archaeologists excavated a trash-filled pit beneath the structure. For a while, it looked as if we caught Obadiah Hogue in one of those contradictions between what historical archaeologists call observed behavior, Hogue as described by his contemporaries, and preserved behavior, Hogue as reflected by his trash. What was excavated in the trash pit, based on the presence of artifact types frequently associated with overseas Chinese communities, would cause an archaeologists to scratch their head a bit to try to unravel the situation. 
The oldest wooden residence in Santa Rosa, the Hoke House, is also the last home remaining from the city's first residential neighborhood, laid out in 1853 by the town's founding fathers. The town began to fill with homes and businesses, and in September of 1854, it displaced the city of Sonoma as the county seat. Two months later, Julio Carrillo sold the parcel of land that was later occupied by the Hogue House to John Ingram for $168. This parcel was just outside the city limits. John Ingram helped in the original town survey and according to his obituary, constructed most of the first houses in Santa Rosa. And it's probable that the Hoke House was built by John Ingram between 1854 and 1857, at which time he sold the easternmost 431 feet of his lot, including the Hoke House site, to William Crow for $1,000. In 1863, Crow sold his first street lot to C.J. Hannett, a San Francisco-based real estate speculator who already owned the former Richardson property to the east. In 1870, Hannett sold the property to attorneys John Brown and General Whalen. Some unrecorded transfer of the property may have occurred before this date, however, for an 1867 rather map shows General Whalen as the parcel's owner. Brown and Whalen sold the lot to Armstead Runyon in January, 1871. Runyon was a 49er who came to California with borrowed money and ended up a very wealthy man. Runyon was active in town business during the construction of his home. He must have lived somewhere nearby and it's conceivable that he might have lived in his first street property, his first local holding. In November, 1875, Runyon entered into a lease to own agreement with O.H. Hogue regarding the lot known as the William H. Crow property, whereby Hogue could purchase the property if he paid Runyon $1,150 within one year. Hogue paid half the money, but before the year was up, Hogue could make the final payment. Runyon died in a buggy accident and his property went to probate court. In December 76, Hogue paid that remaining half and obtained legal title to the property that was to remain in his family for the next 100 years. It's an artifact's context of discovery that designates what an archeologist is or is not able to infer about a site and its occupants. In an urban area such as Santa Rosa, the examination of artifacts scattered through a backyard, for instance, would probably lead to the discovery that people lived there in the 19th century that they ate and drank food and beverages from glass and ceramic containers or in glass and ceramic tableware. Nothing surprising or new. Only artifacts that come from discrete contexts, such as backfilled wells or trash pits can be used as time capsules to tell us something about the lives of particular people at particular points in time. The trash pit was located under addition to the original 1850s building. The artifacts in the pit must therefore dated before the addition, the period of the construction supplying the date before which the pit must have been filled. Obi and Lucrena Hogue and their children, numbering at least five, probably moved to Santa Rosa in November of 1875. Due to Runyon's death, it was not until December 1876 that they received legal title to the first street property in which they were living. The Hogue's new house was probably small for the growing family, Mrs. Hogue gave birth to 12 children, eight of whom who survived adulthood. On the basis of his lease to own agreement, Hogue made improvements to the house he was in the process of purchasing. Based on the documentary record, the building techniques and materials used in the addition and the artifacts found sealed under it combined to support a date in 1876 for the construction of the addition. The artifacts in the trash pit fill represent what archaeologists call a transitional or house cleaning episode in the property's history, a point when a change in the ownership or occupation took place. In this scenario, the artifacts themselves do not relate to the Hogue family, but to the former residents. The Hogues were merely engaged in a short comment to new householders. They cleared out, the they cleared out reminders of previous tenants and disposed of the garbage out of sight. Um, and, you know, to me in finding this one, it was amazing because I thought too, like many others, that the excavation underneath the Hogue house would get tied to the Hogues and nope, surely not, apparently. Um, and as we move on our uh, kind of high level overview, we're going to continue down the street a smidge. 
because in 1987, there were some excavations done at the corner here, Santa Rosa Avenue and 4th Street for a four-story office development that exists today. Uh, surface surveys there identified some cultural material and excavations were carried out following some backhoe scrapes across the parcel. Two historic features were uh, uh, discerned, an artifact in charcoal rich lens of soil just beneath the cleared surface, and then a second trash pit. Uh, feature A, the artifact rich soil contained both Chinese ceramics and food bone, the kinds of material most useful in archaeological analysis. However, this feature was not legally important. It was a distinct layer, but it was not possible to be sure of this feature's integrity due to its position just below the surface. It may have been disturbed or been accumulated over a long period of time. In either case, it's doubtful that all the materials in the feature are associated with Chinese occupants or the lot at any particular point in time. Feature A, therefore, lacks that substantial stratigraphic stratigraphic integrity required that often archaeologists cite. Uh, in some ways, paradoxically, paradox, paradoxically, feature B um, has the integrity required, but it lacks the research potential. Uh, it just contained too few artifacts. And so while the pit was dis discreet and, and had its integrity, uh, without any artifacts to, to give meaning to um, it as well was uh, found to be a non-important, not a historical resource. So we're going to be moving a little bit west just outside our area that I laid out at the beginning for one, uh, for some more here. And this is one where uh, we get to, uh, um, again, dive into uh, a, a, a scientifically dug uh, excavation of some features, one in which provides some really nice uh, contrast and comparison with uh, the Menifee site that we talked about earlier. Uh, this work done here at the uh, uh, Days Insight uh, began in 85 uh, when a surface survey did identify some materials and uh, the archeologists at the time recommended that uh, further monitoring be done if work continued out on, on the project and in 1988, work resumed. So archaeologists were contracted to come out and the archaeologists uncovered and evaluated what was found. And only one of them was believed to be, uh, excuse me, significant under CEQA criteria. And uh, they began to do some excavation. And uh, there was another feature, uh, but it was looted ahead of uh, investigation by archaeologists. Um, the one feature that was excavated um, had a uh, terminus post-queen uh, TPQ, meaning the earliest possible date of 1867. Uh, the orientation of the feature uh, show that it had to come in as the lots were created. It, it, it was tied to these lot lines. Um, and through other historical research, the deposits were then associated with a Patrick and Jane Redmond who purchased the lots in the spring of uh, 1872. Uh, the Redmonds were also among the many Southerners who uh, came to seek a better life in Sonoma County following the close of the Civil War. Um, at the war's end, many Southern immigrants felt comfortable making a new home in Santa Rosa, and uh, we, uh, we see this trend uh, significantly. Uh, the archaeologists began their uh, investigation using shovels and trowels, uh, and they dug, ex they dug the uh, pits stratigraphically. Uh, and they appear that the pit and trench were opened up at the same time and likely uh, filled in with uh, some demolition debris as well uh, to cap it. And the Redmond collection really gives, in some ways, the, the first um, undisturbed stratified deposit that we can have tight dates on whole artifacts or reconstructable artifacts um, and a rich documentary record. And when we get at these situations, we can really start playing with um, um, topics such as urban geography and consumer behaviors. We can go with change over time. Um, it really allows us to begin the comparisons between maybe some of the frugal choices made by the Menifees and maybe some of the more consumer-based choices 
by the Redmonds. Um, a lot of their purchases seem to be aligned with the materials that were being promoted in either a Sears Roebuck catalog or other uh, available sources of consumer culture at the times. These are the things that would have been on sale down at the department stores. Um, and so these two collections can really at times form and underlie a really nice uh, comparison and contrast. Um, and those are, um, you know, some of the, the, the best situations where we get these compare and contrasts um, out there and allows us to take uh, and perhaps speak more meaningful about, meaningfully about uh, the excavations, the materials recovered, um, albeit when the, the Zen Venn diagram, if you will, of cultural evolution, um, site formation processes and historic disturbances align to allow an archeological deposit to still remain there and be found during uh, a development review process. And, you know, at this time, um, you know, I wanted to bring it back around and, uh, and just, just give some thanks. Um, there's been countless numbers of folks involved over the 50 years or so, almost 60 years of archeological work that's been done in Santa Rosa. We've seen the typical, if you will, trajectory of the field over time uh, in our city. Um, but we've seen also a lot of wonderful efforts by individuals to, to do what they can to, to see that the information um, is, is recorded, maintained, and uh, brought out to the public. Um, I had to thank uh, Ron Melander, Ray Owens, and Tom King for their work on that 73 study, as well as the later work by various folks from Sonoma State in the 70s and 80s. Um, and just wanted to thank again, Adrian and Mary Patsellis for their stories, their research and their efforts toward a better understanding of historic era archeology span in our area. Um, and of course my kiddos, Zachary and Isabella and my wife, Anna, for all your support. Um, you're, always, uh, you're always on my mind and, and you give me wind in my wings. Um, moving this forward, uh, we hope to have more of these type of talks. I do hope to, to bring folks uh, um, on and uh, get some more conversations going about some of the past projects that, that have uh, gone on here in Santa Rosa. And um, I hope this is just that overview and, and we get to dive a little deeper um, uh, in the future with this. And, um, you know, at this point, uh, you know, there's some information on the screen there if you're interested in reaching out to me directly about uh, questions or comments. Uh, and, uh, at this point too, uh, turning it back to my uh, dear compatriot, Leslie, um, you know, I'd be happy to entertain some questions, some comments and, uh, and anything else that folks might have to discuss. Thank you, Brian. Uh, what an enormous amount of information is held underground and in these, in these various sites. Thank you for bringing it to life for us. Uh, we have had a few questions in chat, and I also want to let folks know that um, I am having just a tad bit of technical difficulties. So if your screen is showing one of us and not the other um, while we are talking, I am trying to correct that issue, but it will all be okay because at least we're talking and we are on screen. So we will be here and um, looking to that chat. I also wanna point out that if you did not hear this at the beginning of the webinar, that our chat here on Zoom is open and available. So that chat bar is where you go to key in your questions or your comments for Brian. And if you're joining us on Facebook with our live stream on Facebook. We do have an administrator on hand on Facebook and they will be taking your questions from the comment section and bringing them over to Zoom. So we are including those folks that are over on our Facebook page as well. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening. So we had a question very early on um, around the establishment of the bachelor's, master's, or PhD in archaeology, and about the timeline that that happened, um, if that was really established in 1966, um, mm -hmm. and 
how many degrees were maybe earned uh, prior to that or after that. Um, do you do you happen to know that information, Brian? Is that something that you? Well, to be clear, the the date nineteen sixty six that I was speaking out was really going after the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act. The National Historic Preservation Act underlied, if you will, formed the, the basis for the field of cultural resource management. Um, there definitely were PhDs, probably in bachelor's and master's in archaeology prior to 1966, for sure. Um, there were lots of archaeologists uh, running around prior to 66. Uh, that PhD has been around for a long time. The thing that changed in 66 and later was that the field became integrated within planning processes. Um, you know, the, now all of a sudden, if the federal government was going to build a dam, they had to uh, consider the construction of that dam on uh, any archaeological sites that were going to be impacted then by the creation of the dam. And so before 1966, there really wasn't any laws per se that required that. There was a few here and there in certain situations, but the broader field of cultural resource management wasn't around. And the Historic Preservation Act of 66 is really what got that going. So it wasn't that the profession created the disciplines or anything at that time, but that's when the laws got passed that made it part of our part of public practice, if you will. Just like we now are concerned with uh, uh, greenhouse gases or noise and water uh, um, uh, pollution. Um, you know, these are things that existed for, for, for decades, but only since the laws were passed are they part of our planning efforts. And so that's what I was going for there. Thanks. Hopefully that, hopefully that answers the question there. Yeah. And I also want to just, you know, obviously I, I'm sitting back here having chatted with Brian a little bit and uh, just kind of amazed at all of the information that he brought forward. And so are a number of the folks that are watching us this evening um, getting accolades about how great the presentation were, was. And, and thank you for that. Thank you for including those comments in our chat bar or on Facebook. Here comes another question for you. Uh, if you have any knowledge of the attempts to find the resting places of the murdered bear flaggers near Shenate Road, I, that's a little out of the geographical area that you're speaking about this evening. Um, but if you're able to share any information with us, uh, the question comes from Brett and he's asking if you knew the status of that effort. Not specifically. I've heard uh, that um, I remember reading, I believe it was in the Press Democrat some time ago, that there was, I believe, some possibly some, uh, I think there were some canine dogs brought in uh, in different places. There's been different efforts at times. Uh, regrettably, I can't, um, I can't really hit that one up. I don't know the status of that specifically. Um, you know, Brett, I'm happy to try to play see if I can find any uh, efforts if, you know, if you know of any individuals that are, are working on that effort, um, you know, I'm happy to kind of um, look into that, but yeah, sorry about that. And moving right along, uh, we've got the, uh, another question here about mm -hmm. that 1966 act. Yeah. Uh, did it, did it affect only the public projects or, or did it also have impact on the private projects? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's enough of a fun question. If there's any follow up <laughs> ones to that, just put them in a, in a B side. But yeah, I mean, the, so the federal laws that got passed, um, the, the nexus is federal money, federal lands or federal permits. So if you're private project is dredging a water of the United States, um, you know, that would be a project that the federal laws would be applicable towards, even though it's your private project, um, I guess, if you will. Um, the main thing where we hit private projects, honestly, is more in the state laws. Um, and 
Um, and a lot of that comes from, uh, uh, there were some court cases that challenged the applicability of the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA. At first when CEQA was passed in the, we'll say 1970, just for a date, um, some people in, in uh, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, when that first came out, its focus was largely on um, projects derived from the local government. Later on, it was turned in, uh, to if a permit was needed from the city or county or the local government. So it, the way it is nowadays, uh, ever since uh, I believe it was in 80, if I'm not mistaken, or 70s, but yeah, for a long time now, uh, uh, the applicability of the California Environmental Quality Act is extended to these discretionary permits that say the city of Santa Rosa gives. So if it's a private project that's of one type, it may not be subject to these laws. If it's a private project of a different type, it may be. And they differentiate certain projects as discretionary and ministerial. And we can have a fun uh, webinar all about cultural resource management laws um, as well, too, uh, if that's something folks would like to hear. Um, that's, you know, I honestly got into this field largely for trying to get after the why people have to do what they do. Um, you know, uh, so, uh, it's a, it's a fun, uh, effort to try to understand the why, um, I may not always agree with the why, um, <laughs> um, but it's, uh, at times, uh, you know, oh, good to work through it, if you will. Um, so. And there was a little bit of a follow-up question with that around when did the private home construction fall under any cultural laws is that your reference to around 1980 yeah, yeah I, I i'm some some professors of mine are, are shaking their fists at me right now for not remembering this specifically but as a good grad student i know i could look up the information pretty quickly if i uh, was given time but um basically uh when mammoth uh, there was a lawsuit down in Central California that extended the applicability of CEQA. And I want to say it was like 77 for some reason. Um, but in the late 70s, they, they tweaked CEQA to apply to uh, projects whereby a private applicant needs that permit, um, not just the uh, you know, public work project by the local government. So, so the permitting concept came into play at that point. Well, well, we'll send you home with some homework. So there you go. There you then go. You'll, <laughs> you can get back to us on all of that. Um, the Sears building, you know, that's been a, in, in topic of conversation lately and in the news uh, with the county uh, expressing some interest and some hesitancy around uh, taking over that building for budget reasons and whatnot and building their multi story government building there. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is if you had any ideas, if anything, uh, of what was maybe found underneath that site where the Sears store, store was uh, yeah. before it went in uh, in 1980 or so. Yeah, you know, that one didn't come up as far as the locations where some of these monitoring efforts were focused on over time. So um, to be clear, uh, not to say there wasn't anything there, but it doesn't seem like folks were looking for anything there at the time. Um, now, as with a lot of the development, um, there's a lot of depends on how that construction was undertaken. Uh, how deep does the Sears, current Sears store go down, um, if you will, and how, if, is there any, uh, you know, um, original soil surfaces or relic land surfaces present there. Um, it's probable that most of the historic era land surfaces were destroyed um, during the construction of it. Um, you know, and how far down does that go? Um, you know, this brings up a really great point. Um, you know, when I was talking about the uh, depth, at, you know, in a lot of cases, they didn't go down more than a meter or two in the uh, renewal project. Um, now that might seem like a lot, again, a meter is about three feet. Um, 
for whatever reason, archaeologists often deal with uh, pre-contact or indigenous ar archaeology and metric, and then we deal with historic era archaeology and feet and inches. You know, it's uh, it's kind of goofy like that. But the long and the short of it, um, in a lot of places, they just didn't go that deep, in my opinion, in the '73 work. Um, we have an example in uh, outside of this study area in eastern, more eastern Santa Rosa. We'll say hypothetically east of E Street somewhere, magically, uh, underneath a uh, office parking garage building, um, was found uh, the only uh, intact uh, buried site. It was found during monitoring, a Native American site. It was found eight feet below ground. So almost three meters. So about a meter deeper than they really ever went in the uh, urban renewal project. So yeah, in the, in the mid, early to mid nineties, the site was found during monitoring. Uh, they found about eight feet below. Uh, the site had two different components to it, too, which was neat. It had a component that dated from about one to 2,000 years ago. And then it had another component that dated from about 4,500 to about 5,500 years ago. Yeah. Um, archaeologists could see in the cut walls that much of the site was still present, and it appeared to extend outside the development that had hit it. And so as often the case in cultural resource management, you know, we're there because of a project. And so we hit a property line or a project boundary and we can't go chase the site out to know where it goes because the end of the project is there. Um, so this is one of those cases where it showed to archeologists at the time that there are buried sites at significant depth at times in this area. Um, they also identified a soil horizon in that project that dated to 8,500 years ago. And we know people were around this area at that time. We have sites that date to that age. There weren't any artifacts themselves found on this buried soil horizon, but they were able to get, um, uh, uh, I believe it was a piece of charcoal that they were able to date uh, from a natural fire uh, on that horizon and they dated it to that. And they hypothesized that that buried soil horizon as well extends outside. And so it really provided um, for archeologists at least um, a cautionary tale in some cases that we, we definitely have a, um, a soil, a landscape evolution here in the Santa Rosa Plain where we have deep alluvium in places. And, development needs to consider that as it moves forward. Um, sometimes we don't find things because we don't dig deep enough. Um, you know, I've been in urban areas in downtown cities and, and have sat there staring at a bazillion story building while looking at a buried archeological deposit that's intact because it's, it just didn't get hit by the, development that only went down 10 feet, say, you know, and apparently Santa Rosa has some places like that. Now is the Sears store area uh, one of those? I don't know. That's for some future individuals to, to sleuth out, for sure. And maybe potentially if there's further construction on that site, that, that yeah. could be the, the magic. Well, that would, you know, there's, there's, and that's, you know, there's, uh, you know, I, I kind of hinted on it earlier. I mean, there is a great debate too. Even if we, even if we know something's there, should we dig it? Um, you know, uh, can we dig it? Should we dig it? Um, and if we do dig it, um, who gets to look at it? Um, you know, um, who's to say that I should study um, what comes out of the ground? Maybe the material that comes out of the ground is more the domain of uh, another group. Yeah, it's a, they're, they're, they're fun, they're, they're, they're real, they're important questions, I enjoy discussing them, um, and that's one of the reasons in, as well that I had a desire, I, I, I respect the need to keep archaeological site locations private, but I also find at times that we obfuscate the hard conversations 
under those oh, can't talk about it <laughs> conversations and and that's where i'd rather have the hard conversations in a public setting so folks can be informed and, and understand that's great and it's it is very thought provoking um for saying this for someone who maybe hasn't thought about the, all of those ramifications and mm -hmm. questions so um we'll look at some of these uh, archaeological kind of mainstream media <laughs> events a little bit differently. So thank you for that. Um, Emily actually was really wondering about something you had mentioned, um, that there was a recorded dig in 1960. Uh, are you able to say what that was? Uh, yeah, but not right now. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll get back to Emily on that one. <laughs> I don't no. remember. I don't remember the specific one off the top of my head. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, and it was in the '60s, so my guess is it was like late '60s. So that that slide had the whole decade from 1960 to 1969 on it. Um, so it was the '60s. So. My guess is it was something in 67, 68, or 69 that was done. Great. And, you know, we can probably include this information on the Facebook page, a little follow up uh, yeah. for those folks that. If, it, had, if Emily's out there, if you're a Facebook person, uh, let the chat room know. And, and, and you know, if not, we'll, we'll find you one way or the other, Emily. Yeah. Or Emily can find you. You've got your you go. email address right here on the screen. Uh, Brian much at Gmail. So reach out to Brian and follow up with that question. Uh, also, I have a question from Karen about adobe soil and whether or not that preserves or degrades a buried artifact. Adobe soil. So adobe soil, when I hear that word, I think of like a real clay based soil. And uh, what that kind of makes me think of is a soil, you know, and it's soil is exists within a world of oxygen and oxygen degrades stuff <laughs> so if you can get it in that anaerobic -y, if you can get that adobe soil underneath water then then the answer would be yeah probably i mean i have a buddy that worked in the uh off off the coast of florida you know and and had a perfect dugout canoe you know from a couple feet down in the mud you know in an offshore area you know it's oxygen is the is the great you know, the acts as oxygen moves in and out of things. That's where the degradation uh, seems to occur. The soil itself probably, if it traps the oxygen away, so maybe clay-based soils do a better job than sandier soils, so maybe a little bit, but there's probably also some chemicals in some soils that could degrade it more or less. And definitely not a uh, soil scientist by any means, but generally speaking soil itself will degrade stuff over time you can get it all the way in water and not have it go in and out of water then you're going to probably have some some hopeful preservation um but yeah well brian it doesn't look like there's um any more questions filling up our chat bar uh folks if you do have a question and you would like Brian to attend to it, please do key it into our chat bar. Or if you're on our Facebook live stream, go ahead and put that in the comment areas and we'll bring it over here to Zoom. Um, but just give you a moment. I know putting together uh, a presentation like this um, seems almost uh, beyond challenging just to whittle down the information to a digestible amount uh, in 45 minutes or an hour. So I leave it open to you, just a big open question here. What was something that you uh, would have liked a little bit more time to talk about and or um, that you're looking forward to bringing to these webinars in the future as a topic? To be honest, some of the stories that come out of the project. Um, I was only able to really uh, kind of, you know, the, the the historical society publication where the Pretzelises wrote off of the Hope House that um, the writing style was wonderful. I just I couldn't not read that. Um, but some of the some of the data that underlies 
the, the lives of these individuals and the stories that come from that. To me, really, I mean, when I read about uh, the, the um, in some ways, you know, it, I start to feel, you know, like maybe I'm looking at myself, you know, you, you start to, you know, you see these uh, corollaries between someone living in 2022 and someone living in 1880 perhaps. Um, I've always been enamored by historic era archaeology and food ways. So uh, looking more at how we try to blend in in a culture, but keep parts of ourselves is something that fascinates me. And food often is, in my opinion, one of the last things that people hold on to. I may hypothetically dress to look like standard society i may do everything but it, at night i might go home and eat a meal that is true to me whoever i am um, and i think food I, I love cooking so maybe that's part of it too but i think food really gets to people and so to me going into some of the faunal analyses that speak to food ways and life ways that's where i get really excited and jazzed um, the consumer behavior research is really interesting i mean the end of the 1870s, 80s, you get this mass. I mean, the trains come in, you got refrigeration out there on refrigerated cars, all these new packaging cans are, I mean, and that's when consumerism really flies off the shelf. And so it, it really interests me looking at those comparative studies of consumerism in the 19th century and consumerism in the 21st century and, and the differences and similarities there. Um, you know, I hope some students write some papers on that so we can talk about them sometime. I don't have the time to get into that type of research per se, but I see those as great opportunities and such. Um, I do hope that I can work with uh, some of the archaeologists in our area to bring more, um, more deep dives here um, in, you know, on some of these projects. Um, try to find those projects that we can talk about. Um, there's a lot of pro projects, in my opinion, that we should talk about. Um, public funded projects should have an interpretive and outreach component. And most of the time, those are the first things that get cut on a budget. And it's, a, it's such a bummer when you get a project that had some federal funding or even state funding to it. And then all of a sudden, the public can't, can't draw the benefit from it. And that bothers me. Um, I, not to say this is in any way uh, um, a solution for it, but... Um, you know, the idea of being able to work with uh, folks from the area and provide a forum for them to, you know, get some of that rich history out there while keeping archaeological sites uh, uh, protected at the same point in time, getting that information out there, uh, that would be appealing to me in, in the future. Um, you know, and I, I always find little gems as, as I'm going through some of this research and, I'm, you know, um, you know, I guess there's a, a comment that came up that really caught my eye about um, Julio Carrillo had a small adobe just east of E Street, I guess. And it was the first time I had heard about uh, uh, that Carrillo's adobe. I'd spent a lot of time with the other Carrillo's adobe over kind of Maria's. Uh, <laughs> But uh, uh, it was the first time uh, in preparing for this work that I had bumped into some, some references to uh, Julio Carrillo's Adobe. And so that was a neat one for me to see. Um, but there's, uh, there's so many little stories buried in this one. And uh, the thing too is, is that there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of future research yet to be done because I think there's a lot of stuff still out there. Um, both in the stacks and the research world, but also in the archaeology. That's exciting to hear, definitely. Also exciting here is this uh, comment around a potential future Historical Society Santa Rosa presentation of food of early Santa Rosa. Who wouldn't be into that, right? Absolutely. That sounds great. That sounds absolutely great. <laughs> definitely. Sure. So. Well, I appreciate everybody's questions and comments. Um, thank you, Brian, so much for all of the information this evening. It's really been a joy and actually has opened up a door for those future presentations um, and working with folks. And so I want to segue right into talking about 
uh, our next presentation. And folks, if you were with us last year in 2021, you may remember that many of the presentations were each month. And uh, this year in 2022, we're going to allow you and, and encourage you to, at your, at your own pace, go and enjoy uh, some outdoor activities potentially and give you a month off and bring back the presentations every other month. So our next presentation is on Thursday, April 21st of this year at 6 p.m. So the, typically is the third Thursday of the month. It'll be April. It will be the next one on April 21st. And this one is titled Sonoma County Druggist and Pharmacies uh, with John Burton. So we're excited to have him here and to dive in to um, the drugstores and pharmacies and uh, everything that that entails. So I know John will have an information-packed webinar ready for you come April 21st. And remember that this information can be found at historicalsocietysantarosa.org, also on the Facebook page. Uh, when it becomes a little bit closer to that date in April, but I also want to encourage you to go to the historical society santarosa.org page to find more information, especially joining the organization, become a member, donate to the Historical Society of Santa Rosa, and be up on all of the great information and historical information that they have to share with you. Uh, we know from earlier this evening, Brian, that you're the president of the Historical Society of Santa Rosa. Do you have any parting words for us this evening about the organization? Um, you know, it's an organization that uh, is young, but at the same point in time, we've worked together for a while together. We've gotten through some wonderful crises in, in our short life here, um, but we try to have a good time and have a lot of fun. Um, we really enjoy finding ways to get information out to uh, folks of Santa Rosa and wherever else they might live about Santa Rosa. Um, and, you know, we, we really couldn't do it without our members. Uh, and to be clear, uh, our board really wants to find ways to, to engage with our members more and more um, and try to solicit more involvement from members uh, in board activities, joining the board, uh, writing our newsletters. Um, so um, we really do want to make that call out. Um, volunteering is always um, a challenge, especially in all of our busy lives nowadays. But um, my appeal would be um, think of the next generation. So, yeah. History is happening right now, Brian. You are making it with the Historical Society and bringing forth all of this great information. And a really pleasant part of these webinars is that this is recorded history. So this recording of the webinar itself, as well as all of the past webinars that the Historical Society of Santa Rosa produced last year are on their YouTube page. So do go to the YouTube uh, website and just put in the search bar Historical Society of Santa Rosa and you'll see the full uh, catalog of webinars from 2021, uh, one from 2020 in October, the first one, and now the 2022 webinars as well. And you can also catch those webinars by going to their Facebook page and visiting and following their Facebook page and uh, watching them as a live presentation on there uh, during 2022 or going back and watching them on there during as part of their video files. Um, and I just wanna say real quick, I'm gonna give Julie some of the last words here. She just wrote in the chat, as a new member, this presentation is fantastic. I'm putting the emphasis on there for her. Her family has been here for many years near Mark West Creek. And uh, Brian, now here is the big, where is the gold? So she wants uh, to know, yes, where's question. the gold? Yep. <laughs> Still haven't found it, never found it. 
been looking for gold ever since I moved to California. I went right into gold country, still couldn't find the gold. Did find a gold pan, a miner's pan. It was that was that was probably the closest I got. Well, you know that that dime that you mentioned from 18, I 61. forget the date. Yeah, it was 1861 Eight, or something like that. 1861. That that's like gold right there. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, with dates are great. Who who doesn't want something with like a little date stamped on it? I mean, at least yeah. an archaeologist one. But um, yeah, the gold's hiding from us all. It's probably right underneath that rainbow for you, Julie. So hopefully we can all go get it. <laughs> and there's gold in the Historical Society of Santa Rosa. So be sure to visit their page, get all of that information and become a member and donate. Keep, keep the Historical Society going. Brian, thank you so much again for all of the information, you, your time and energy to share all of this with us and keep the top secret stuff top secret. So appreciate that you did that. Uh, remember folks, on April 21st, Thursday at 6 p.m. is our next webinar with Mr. John Burton, Sonoma County Druggist and Pharmacies. So be ready for that one. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much for joining us and everybody stay safe out there. Have a great evening. Bye.